guys, welcome to the Gospel of John. Here we are, Lesson 69. We're at the end of the Gospels. But one of the things you need to know about the Gospel of John that's so radically different, 98% of the material is unique. So what you're going to see in the Gospel of John is going to be all new, all fresh. Very rarely is it going to be the same from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in fact, one of the commentators, Warren Wearsby, says that here you have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you're going to see events. They're going to write about events tell about events, but what you're going to see with the Gospel of John is the meaning of the events. Like it just seems to be not as reporting, but hey, here is, here's the heart behind some of these things. Now, the, the writer of John, Kevin, I really think you're going to get this one right. Who do you think wrote the Gospel of John? Was it a guy named John? It's a God, God, it's a guy named John. Uh, in scripture, he actually describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. You got to love. It's almost like Moses-esque, isn't it? You know, like Moses says, I'm the most humble guy. Oh yeah, I'm the guy that Jesus loved, right? So you kind of have a little bit of this. And so, but yet at the same time, a couple other components of John. John has a brother named James. James and John, uh, James is the older brother. They are known as the sons of thunder. thunder. Sons of thunder as as he was labeled, as they were labeled in Mark 3, but they're also known as the sons of Zebedee. That would be Zebedee, not like their last name. Uh, very clearly, John is also an apostle. Okay, so here you have an apostle. Now, one of the cool things about Peter, James, and John, you guys, oh my goodness, in the Gospel of Matthew, didn't we not talk about those guys all the time, Peter, James, and John? It's like the inner circle of the 12, right? So at the Transfiguration, at Jairus' daughter, at the Garden of Gethsemane, three different scenarios, Jesus says to his buddies, Peter, James, and John, I need you to be with me in this time. This is that same, same John. So John has, I would say, a very close associate with Peter. Uh, many times he's listed as an eyewitness. Now, I'm going to spend some a little bit more time, may, maybe than I normally would, on the backdrop, but you got to understand. So, Kevin, can you go to 1 John 1, verse 1? I want to read four verses, 1 John 1. This is, now remember this, John also wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. So here you have the writer of the Gospel of John. He's written five letters. This guy is legit. How many, how many letters did, or how many books did Moses write? Five. Five. So Paul obviously wrote more than John, but I just want to give you an idea of how important this guy is in Jesus' life. Why? Because look what he says in 1 John 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, verse 2, that life was revealed and we have seen it. And we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us, verse 3. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now in verse 4, it says this, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Now think about this. Here's a guy who's written five books of the Bible. John, right? John has written this. And as a result, he knows the ins and the outs of Jesus. How cool is this? This is a firsthand account, so no longer is he getting it from somebody else, but he's getting this from Jesus firsthand. Now, when, when did he write this? Well, I love what MacArthur says. Probably around 80, 80 or 90. Okay, now a couple of the backdrop, okay? Just some more things. You know how we said 98% usually of this material is unique. A couple other things. It's the unique amount of a material, not in others, and here's what happened. It supplied the info to support. So the Gospel of John supported the information for Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And crazy enough, the Gospel of John is probably what I would say as the most theological of the four. In other words, this one is going to make you chew on the meat constantly. We got a new phrase, Son of God. So all throughout the Gospel of Luke, we emphasize Jesus' humanity. Now in the Gospel of John, we emphasize that Jesus is actually God. So let's go to John 20, verse 30 and 31. Very, very rarely do you see actually in the book of, uh, of the Bible the actual purpose for this. Verse 30, it says this, Jesus performed many other signs 
in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. Now watch what it says in verse 31. But these are written. Okay, so why are all of these things written in the Gospel of John? They're written so that you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. So the purpose of John is actually written actually in John. It's, it's like, well, praise God. We didn't even have to come up with this. The purpose is that you believe in Jesus, that he is the Messiah. And you ready for this? That he is the Son of God. That even though he's the Son of Man here on earth, he still is 100% God. Now, there's a couple key words that you're going to see in the Gospel of John. One of those is the word science. You're going to see seven signs all throughout the Gospel of John. I'm not going to write them on here, but I want you to understand. In fact, tomorrow, Josh Edwards is going to teach on this, is that one of the signs is Jesus turns water into wine. Another sign is that he heals the official son. Another miraculous sign is you're going to see the healing of the lame man. Number four, you're going to see the miracle of the feeding of the multitude. And then how about the crazy one, walking on water? Number six, one of the other miracles, okay, remember seven of these was at the healing of the blind man. And then number seven was the raising of Lazarus. I, I say this because there's this theme of signs all throughout the Gospel of John. Another word that you're going to see constantly, even in John 20, 31, is the word believe. So you're going to see a couple key words, signs, believe, and then the, the one that I love is you'll see life. You will see these three words described all throughout, all throughout the Gospel of John. And so as you hear this purpose found in John 20, verses 30 and 31, right? You're going to see two things that I love what MacArthur says. One is you're going to see a theme that it's evangelistic. The Gospel of John is evangelistic. I want you to believe in him. Like there's a constant, do you believe in me? There's this evangelistic mentality and in fact, a hundred times believe is mentioned. But then the other component that I just want to lay out here that MacArthur says is that it's apologetic. Uh, apologetic is that you're constantly trying to, uh, you're communicating in a, I'll, I'll just say Kyle language, in a really heady intellectual way. Like you're trying to give them a whole lot of substance so that you can connect with somebody really smart. <laughs> Right? In that sense. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to, in, in this case, you know what the apologetics is? You're trying to show your readers and the audience, just so you know, is Jews and Gentiles. You're trying to show your readers that Jesus's identity is actually the incarnate God man. So in the apologetics, you're going to take different angles to show and to prove, I'm an eyewitness, remember he says, that Jesus really is the son of God. Now, normally in some of these other writers, it might take a more simple approach. You're going to get a whole lot more meat, a whole lot more substance. All right, here we go. I think we're, I think we, that might have been the longest backdrop we've done on a book, but there's so much here. And I feel like as we continue to bring in different teachers, as we continue, and just so you know, as we continue to bring in different teachers, I have no problem telling you this. You want to know, you know why? One is, is I think that we can learn from not just me. I think we can learn from many different teachers. And then two, this is a lot. I have no problem telling you guys. Prepping for seven to 14 lessons a week. Um, I love it, but I need a balance and I need a little bit of, of room to breathe. And so as you see uh, a couple guys come here and there, whether it's pastors from Indiana or team members, you know, from Florida or from Minnesota, uh, we believe God can speak through them. So I'll be the majority of the teaching. That's not the issue. I'm just bringing in some help. And so I, I just want to tell you that, like not avoid the obvious because this is all, <laughs> I don't care what I said. I, I have studied this in the past, but whenever you study it again, it's like, okay, I, I, Lord, give me fresh insight. Give me new stuff, not just maybe for anybody else, but Lord, what are you saying to me? And so that, that's where we're at. So when I started looking at John 1, 1 through 18, I was like, Lord, just keep speaking to me. And so what we're going to do is we're going to unfold really the, the outline in six sections, okay, in John 1, 1 through 18. So, all right, so the very first section that we're going to identify, okay, is the eternal. Again, this comes from John MacArthur on this one here, the eternal Christ, Okay, so the first three verses, this is what it looks like. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, automatically, when you see this phrase, in the beginning, Kevin, where do you go? Genesis. Absolutely, Genesis 1-1. Let, let's just go there if you can. 
in the beginning was the Word. So in Genesis 1.1, what does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there's a tie-in that in the beginning, the Word existed. Does that make sense? Since the beginning of time, the Word existed. And then look what it says. And the Word was with God. So what I see here automatically is I see two, right? If the Word was at the beginning and then the Word was with God, that implies the Word is here and God is here. And then look what it says. Then it will really play games with you. And then it says, and the Word was God. So those two, the Word and God, right now I'm just going to tell you, Word is capitalized. I'm just saying this because right now you and I can't say right now, just based on this, that this is Jesus. Does that make sense? Like, who is the Word? That's the process. Who is the Word? The Word was at the beginning. The Word was, was God. We just know that whoever or whatever the Word is, is God. Is that a fair statement? And so I think sometimes you automatically, you go to that verse and you go, oh yeah, it's Jesus. And you're like, well, how do you know? <laughs> well, you got to start putting some things together, but I just want you to understand the language here. I'm not just going to naturally assume. I think you need to understand that. Now in the Greek, when it says the word was God, theos and hot logos, okay? The Greek word, okay, and it, it, it is implied, I, I love reading that. The word was God. Now, if you go back to the word was with God, okay, this is kind of a cool picture here. It's a Greek construction, okay, that implies the word right there. We do know this based on the Greek wording, okay, in all of these, that the Greek word had the essence and the attributes of, de of the deity fully God. Just by looking at that Greek word, we can imply that there is the full essence and deity of the attributes of God. In fact, Kevin, can you go to Colossians 2.9? I think this is a great picture of just this one verse says, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. When I see John 1, 1, I want you to automatically think Colossians 2, 9. I want you to automatically go there because it says the entire fullness of God's nature. So the, everything about God dwells in the body of Christ. Isn't that awesome? So he, the Word was in the beginning. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And then it says in verse 2, uh, actually, Kevin, I want to I go back. Go to John 17, verse 5. We'll see how far we get today. John 17, verse 5, it just says this. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. So what I'm trying to keep showing you is that at the beginning, Christ, what does it say here? Christ was with them at the beginning. We also know that, that that Greek word, the word was with God. We know that that Greek word implies it has all of the essence and the attributes of the deity fully of God. And then we know that in Colossians 2, 9, we do know that if it was at the beginning and it was with God, we do know that that word that was God, uh, Kevin, you got to go back to Colossians 2, it, it, the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. So you can just start saying, you know, that word, the word could be Christ. At this context, you can't say that, but it could be Christ as we begin to unfold the language. Here's the one thing I like about this. There's no genealogy in the Gospel of John. You want to know why? Because verse 1 is the genealogy. He was at the beginning. He doesn't need to show that he's with Adam or Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. He was God. And so I love this. Again, everything's different in verse 3. Look at this. All things were created through him. So everything, I, I just kind of have a visual in my mind. I don't know. It's a bad visual. You know, <laughs> here in the beginning, uh, right, is Jesus. Okay. Or if you want to just say the word and it says everything was created through him. He functions as the creator. When's the last time you've called Jesus your creator? Well, there's so many verses, John 1, 3, we know that here. Can you go to, Kevin, let's go to Ephesians 3, 9. Again, Ephesians 3, 9 says this, And to shed light for all the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things. So we're establishing that clearly God created these things. But where does Jesus fit into this? Can you go to Hebrews 1, 2? Hebrews 1, 2. So again, God created all these things in these last days. He has spoken to us by his Son. God had appointed him heir of all things and look, and made the universe through him. If God is the creator, now we're saying Jesus is the creator. We might be closer to saying now that Jesus is the word. If he was there at the beginning, 
if the word was at the beginning. So there's so much here. Just want you to understand. And apart from him, it says in verse three, not one thing was created that has been created. So everything that you see was created because of Jesus. Or in this context, you can at least say the word. Make sense? Okay, so here you have the eternal Christ. So what we mean by the word eternal is that he's been here from the very beginning. Okay, fair enough. Would you guys agree? So in the beginning, we know was the word. In the beginning was what we're beginning to think could be Christ. Okay, uh, now if you go to verse four, okay, the verses four and five. Okay, here you have, not only do you have the eternal Christ, but you have the incarnate Christ. And so here you have verses whoops, four and five. So you have the eternal Christ and the incarnate Christ. Life was in him. Okay. So life was in him. Kevin, can you go to John 5, verse 26? John, we're not going to make it through anything today. Uh, okay. John 5, verse 26. For just as the Father has life in himself. So there's life in who? In God. Right? I think that's important. I want to keep establishing the language that you're going to hear with God is the same language that you're going to hear with Christ. For just as the Father has life in himself, right now, if you go back, Kevin, to verse 4, life was in him, life was in the Word, life was in Christ, and that life was the light of men. So when you believe in the life, when you believe in the Word, then Scripture says then that life becomes the light of men. So it naturally carries over. In order to get life, you have to have life from the Word. You have to have life from, from Christ. In verse 5, again, just, just so you know, there's basically supporting verses for everything. <laughs> it's like, yes, here it is. So just kind of know that, you know, if you want to look up the light of men, just know that in John 9, 5, John 10, 28, those things are going to point to that. Okay? Now in verse 5, it says that light. Now remember, that light comes from the life, which that life comes from God. That life comes from the Word. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. The, the darkness did not, as one commentator says, it didn't take hold of it. It didn't overpower it. It did not um, even to the point of uh, embrace it. The darkness did not win. <laughs> so here you have this comparison of light and darkness. Intellectually, light is biblical truth. Intellectually, the darkness is error and false. One commentator says, morally, the light is holiness and purity, but morally, darkness is sin and wrongdoing. So you're always going to see this contract, contrast of light and dark. And what I love is, and look at this in verse, in verse 6, you have the eternal Christ, the incarnate Christ, right? So you have then in verse uh, 6, you have what we would consider the forerunner of Christ. And we know all, already, who is this, guys? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So there was a man named John, not the writer John of the Gospel of John, but J.B., John the Baptist, who was sent from God. And we know prophetically, I mean, here you have 400 years of quietness. And all of a sudden, a guy just shows up. A man who was sent from God. And what was his role? His role was to come as a witness, to testify, to bear witness, to testify about the light. Now we know that that light, let's backtrack, that light comes from life. That life comes from God and that's that life, God is also the Word. Crazy. So this guy testifies all the way about the light and life. Why? Why is he doing this? Because what's the purpose of John? One of them is his evangelistic, so that all might believe through him. So as you walk through John 1, verses 1 through 18, we paint a picture of the eternal Christ. Christ has existed. The word, of, the word has existed from the beginning. I also want you to understand, like what we've been talking about very clearly in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus at the same time, it says that he became the incarnate Christ. As you move on to, to number three, as these things happen about who Christ is, now enters John the Baptist, not the Gospel of John writer, and he is preparing the way right? Of the light and life. So it says on, it goes on in verse eight. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Because one of the things, remember this, Jesus would say to his disciples, hey, who do they say that I am? And some would say John the Baptist. And so there's this mentality as a forerunner of Christ, people got confused. Maybe he is the Christ. 
But that's why I think they're really important in verse 8 when it says he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. He came to talk about this is the light that comes to bring life. Jesus says, I am the, the light. Okay, so now here's where it gets kind of interesting. As you continue to be a forerunner, here's what you see in the, a couple more verses. You begin to see the unrecognized Christ. Okay, these come again from uh, John MacArthur. Watch this, okay? In verse 9, it says this. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. It says in verse 10, he was in the world. Now this world, just so you get an understanding, I love what MacArthur says. It's a, a physical, actual universe. It's also humanity. So he's coming to the universe. He's also coming to humanity. And he's also coming into a, an invisible spiritual system of evil that's coming against him. So he's coming into these atmospheres, these environments, into the world. And as the world was, now here we go again, the world was created through him, which goes back to he's the eternal Christ, right? He was, the world was created through him, yet the world that he created, says, did not recognize him. Scripture continues on in verse 11. This is the one that breaks your heart. He came to his own. Now, his own could be a couple things. One, just general mankind. He came here on earth and they killed him. <laughs> it also could mean the Jewish people. He came to his own people and it says in verse 11, they did not receive him. Man, there's a lot here. Can you go to John 10, verse 25, Kevin? John 10, verse 25 about coming to his own people, he says, I did tell you, and you don't believe. And what you see is rejection after rejection after rejection. The Jewish people saying, no to Jesus, the one who created them. And I, I'll just go all the way to the extreme, though. Watch what happens, though. It says in verse 12, but to all who did receive him. And here uh, I'm going to use the word omnipotent. So he comes to his own people, they say no. And the next thing you know, it says, but to all who did receive him, the Gentiles, a little, little bit of the Jews, but to the Gentiles, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born in verse 13, who were born again. We're going to talk about this in a couple days, about being born again, not of the blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but how are we born? But of, of God. And so this is how I want to close. Watch this. It says, this is really cool. In verse 14, the last point of today, you see the glorious Christ. And that comes verses 14 through 18. So how, how do we know? How do we know that the word was actually Christ? Because in verse 14, it says the word became flesh took up residence among us. We observed his glory. The glory is the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And John, it says in verse 15, he testified concerning him and he exclaimed, this was the one whom I said, the one coming after me has surpassed me because he's existed, look at this, before me. So John the Baptist says he came before. And oh, by the way, he says, oh yeah, and I was, I was before Abraham. Why? Because the eternal Christ was in the beginning. And we know based on verse 14, the word became flesh. Kevin, can you go to 1 Timothy 3.16? 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And most certainly the mystery of godliness is great. Look at this. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Yes, you are talking about the Son of God here. Yes, you're talking about God who came human flesh. Verse 14, and he was the word. And it says, and we close, Kevin, in verse 16 of John 1, uh, really uh, 16, 17, and 18, excuse me. Indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness. And in verse 17, it says, for the law was given through Moses. And in verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. Who, who did he get revealed to? John. He got revealed to us. Now, I know we're going long. I, I, whether we have time for this or not, I, I want to go there. Think about this in verse 14. 
Okay, if I could highlight just one. It says, the word became flesh and took up residence. You understand what that really means? In the Greek, it means he, he pitched a tabernacle. It says he pitched a tent. He lived in a tent. That's what that word means. He took up residence. Now, if you are the Jewish people and you see and hear the word, the word became flesh, flesh and took up residence, you automatically go to God showing up in the tabernacle. You automatically go to Exodus 25, verse 8, where God met Israel in the tent. They are to make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them. Do you understand that in Exodus, that prophetically points to John 1, verse 14, how Christ dwelled among his people. In Exodus 33, 11, what happens? This is so crazy to me, you guys. All of this just fits together. The Lord spoke with Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. Well, guess what? Now Christ is doing that. He lived here. He dwelt among his people so that they could encounter him face to face. Now, here's the radical part about all of this. Eventually, this is a little, a little borderline controversial, but I think you need to understand why. In, in Ezekiel, Warren Wearsby says this, the glory departed eventually from the disobedient Israel. He's not in the tent anymore. And in fact, it says in Ezekiel 9, 3, I'm going to build this real quick here. Ezekiel 9, it says this. Now, does God's hand leave Israel? No, I'm not implying that. But I do want you to understand, it says, then the glory of God of Israel, okay, rose from above the cherubim where it had been to the threshold of the temple. Okay, now, Kevin, if you would go to Ezekiel 10, 4. Okay, I'm establishing there's the glory of God. Ezekiel 10, 4 says this. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim to the threshold of the temple. The temple was filled with the cloud and the, and the court was filled with the brightness of the Lord's glory. Now go to verse 18. Okay, I'm establishing that the glory is there in the temple. Then the glory of the Lord moved away from the threshold of the temple and then stood above the cherubim. Now watch this, okay? One more. In Ezekiel 11, verse 22, there's a progression. Because of the disobedience of the Israelites, watch this. Then the cherubim with the wheels beside them lifted their wings and the glory of God Israel was above them. Verse 23, the glory of the Lord rose up from within the city and stood on the mountain east of the city. The glory departed at this point from the tabernacle. The glory, the glory of the Lord departed, I should say, from the people of Israel. And so then where does he go? Years later, the word became flesh in John 1, 14. The glory of the Lord, look at this in verse 14. We observed his glory. The glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. All of that pointed to saying, Jesus is the answer. Please understand this. I believe God's hand is on Israel and I believe God hasn't left them, but I believe that he is now showing his glory through Christ and no longer in the tabernacle. He's the answer because the Son of God has taken up residence among us. All right, guys, that is John 1, first 18 verses, and I just feel like we scratched the surface. Hey, join us tomorrow as we talk about John 2. Thanks.